Um, I am about to bring on another guest, uh, Mr. Tony Porter, to kind of, you know, we spoke about this a little earlier, talking about the spectrum. Um, you know, how do we bring men into the conversation that we are having today um, about the girl child? So welcome, Mr. Tony. Good to see you again. Thank you, Zenby. Thank you for having me. You're doing an excellent job moderating this Thank conversation. You. Thank you. Thank I you so much. Yes, I appreciate all the speakers that have shared before me uh, an Afri song. Uh, I just I just love it. Uh, just great. Just great work. So let's kick off. Um, let's just start by asking a simple question. What are the gender stereotypes um, that you might have uh, experienced yourself or um, your children might have experienced that, you, you know, you've had to have a conversation about? I guess I'll talk more recently in respect to my children. My two youngest children were both athletes. One is in college now. One is uh, off completed college and working. Uh, they were both high school athletes uh, two years apart. Uh, so I, I was able to watch them compete together. My daughter, Jade, a softball player, my son, Kendall, a football player. And what, you know, uh, I was, I watch when you speak about gender and gender norms and what we value and who we, who we don't value. The football team that my son was on was not a good team uh, and historically never has been a good team. Uh, but I watched over those years how they poured resources into the football team, uh, be it for equipment, be it for building up the stadium, the stands, just, just pouring money into the football team, uh, the publicity around it, the events that they would build around it that would bring out hundreds and hundreds of people. The softball team had won five state championships. My daughter participated in one of those state championships. And even when they didn't win state championships, they were in the final four every single year and very little to no publicity. Very few folks watching a game other than their parents. Uh, very you know, small amounts of resources poured into, only resources that they had to apply uh, to the efforts of the girls, nothing extra. No, you know, so it was just evident when you talk about gender norms and who, because gender norms also speak to value, right? Uh, who we value and what we value also plays out when we're talking about gender norms. And I mean, I challenged them. A lot of folks challenged them uh, throughout that time. Uh, there's no question about it. And, and, you know, our school, and I listened to our other speakers as well, our school systems, uh, are all rooted in the same systems of oppression that we all are speaking of today in reference to dismantling. So where do we start to, you know, try and unlearn these, you know, stereotypes that are, um, you know, like you're saying, in, ingrained in us for years and years? Um, where do we start to, you know, um, investigate in, in schools uh, to, to try and, you know, help, you know, teachers, students, um, and empower them to, to kind of, you know, understand where, you know, because I think also if you don't know that you're, you know, subject to a stereotype and you just think that this is the way that life is, um, it's also hard for you to, you know, make the choice to try to break the chain. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't say where do we start because I would say we're in the midst of it, right? Uh, we're in the midst of it. And just the fact that we're having these conversations right now speak to progress. I don't want to shortchange progress and act as if we're at a starting point with all the challenges that we still have as complicated as it is, we are in the midst of the change. Uh, we're in that process. And the fact that young people like yourself at the forefront, that's, that's very, very, very important. You know, I can add my voice, I can be supportive, but any social change efforts that we've had have been organized, energized, mobilized by young people. So we're in the midst of the change, but we're, you know, we're kind of like some of us older folks, we would say we're in the struggle, right? We're in the struggle, uh, trying to move that change forward. Uh, a lot of stuff is going to be challenging to get done in the traditional education system because of the reasons we've mentioned. I mean, like at our organization, A Call to Men, we have a tendency to speak about healthy manhood 
within our curriculums in the school systems, et cetera, maybe a little more than we'll talk about gender because we can push healthy manhood forward. Because while we're working on this change, we gotta also continue to do the work because there's a definitely an urgency of now. Uh, the lives of women and young girls are at stake. It's just not you know, about equity and equality. It's also about ending violence and oppression. Well, oppression is the equity and equality, but also uh, equity, equality, oppression. Oppression requires violence to be maintained. So we're not just working to, you know, in, in, uh, to bring about equity and equality. We're also working to end an epidemic of violence. Uh, and as the speakers have spoken before me, it's a global epidemic uh, that we're experiencing across the globe. So this is very, very important. So for us, there's that urgency of now. So while, you know, we're doing this work around gender justice, we also have a way of what we call promoting healthy, respectful manhood. See, we know and believe at a call to men that if we're promoting healthy, respectful manhood, just in doing that alone, we're decreasing violence against women and girls. We say as we increase healthy manhood, we decrease violence. Also, when we're promoting healthy manhood, in that teaching is teaching boys to be their authentic selves. Just another way of saying, you know, to put a old, big old dent in those traditional gender roles. When we say to boys, be your authentic selves, we are talking about gender justice. I'm not saying we're not on the front lines along with young people like yourselves and others really naming it exactly what it is. But what we've also found is a way to maneuver and negotiate ourselves into the education system while doing the work and some of it we haven't even named. Not the names that would have them running away scared, you know? Like promoting healthy manhood brings men as a mass into a space because that makes sense to them. Is, is but, this what you would call the, the, the man box? The man box, yeah. yeah. Men get around that man box. They understand it when we speak about it. Young young men kind of like it because it kind of it's cool to them. This man box. Well, let's talk about this man box. Yeah. What's in the, you know, what what, what's what in is the what is the man box? Yeah. In the man box, are all the ingredients of how we've been socialized, taught to define what it means to be a man. We call it the collective socialization of manhood. So in that man box, men must be tough, strong, athletic, aggressive, dominating, controlling, right, protective, right. All all this. You know, uh, men don't ask for help, offer help, accept help. Uh, men don't share their feelings and emotions with the exception of anger. All of this is in this box. And also central to this box, men are taught that women are of less value, that women are the property of men, that women are objects, particularly sexual objects. Now, in this box, it doesn't mean that all men do all the stuff the same way, but what it does mean is that we're all aware of it and we're taught these same rigid notions of what it means to be a man. And at the end of the day, we want to help men understand the importance of breaking out of the man box, right? And breaking out of the man box allows us to be our authentic selves, you know, allows us to then promote equity, equality, and end the oppression of women and girls. And my last million dollar question to you, Mr. Tony, um, I, I, I previously asked you, but we kind of, you know, didn't have the time to, you know, further elaborate. But what is the role of men in this conversation? You know, you've mentioned the type of work a call to men is doing to help um, get men out of the man box. But, you know, sometimes when you're speaking about sexual orientation, um, you know, it's, it's easy for that sexual, you know, group to say, I will be the only person that speaks for myself and my people. Um, and in this instance, when we're talking about the girl child, why is it important to have Mr. Tony Porter having an opinion in this forum? Yeah, because ending, and that's a great question, ending any form of group oppression, it requires a dominating group to be at the table. We live in a male dominating society here in the United States. We have a male dominating, uh, dominating experience globally. Right. We can't end racism if white people are not part of the solution. We can't end heterosexism if uh, cisgender uh, heterosexual people are not part of the solution. Right. 
we can't end any form of oppression without also addressing those who are dominating. Right? They have to be part of the solution. So if we're going to end violence against women and girls, and we're going to promote equity and equality for women and girls, and we're going to end the oppression of women and girls, men, male identified folks have to be part of the solution. Right. We believe that and we talk about violence just in itself. If women could end violence on their own. Well, they would have already. Men have to be part of the solution. We also know that all men are not uh, perpetrators of the violence. If they say uh, one in three women are a victim of violence globally, that means that one in three men are perpetrating violence globally. That means for the most part, there may be two thirds of men are not perpetrating that violence, but we're silent to the violence, right? We've been taught and educated to have less interest in the experience of women and girls. That's how we define manhood by distancing ourselves from the experience of women and girls. That distancing also silences us. That distancing also stops us from being our authentic self. So we believe that if a critical mass of men begin to take this issue on, don't necessarily lead. We're not trying to control. We get, get, got to get alongside of our sisters, in some cases, get behind them right? Let them lead the effort. They understand it better than we do, but we have to be part of the solution. So that's the work at a call to men to bring about a critical mass of men to be part of the solution to ending violence against women and girls. And also understanding that if we can end violence against women and girls, it's healthier for us as men also, because these rigid notions of manhood in this man box is not only fostering an epidemic of violence against women and girls, it's killing us as men also. Uh, my favorite, um, uh, you know, small term that I keep hearing sometimes when people are uh, talking about activism and, you know, mobilizing in the streets is never in front, never behind, but always beside. Um, and I think that would be my, you know, key to men in any type of conversation that they need to be coming together in, in situations like this. Thank you so much, Mr. Tony, for, um, you know, giving your time and uh, sharing it with us and me um, today. It's great um, being with you. Thank you so much. Um, it's been an honor. Um, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing with a call to men. And, um, you know, we hope you can continue to, you know, carry the baton um, to help young men in America.